If you're vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be fully fleshed out, and here is why. In this episode, we find some answers to what do you consider before you spend days and precious mental energy world building? And how can you arrive at some compelling intersections of personally interesting ideas? And what tips and tricks can we glean from Matt Cernet along the way? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Travis. And I'm his brother, Jordan. So this is the second episode in a series, so we're not going to dick around too much in the beginning here. We're going to get right into it. And in the last episode, we had Matt Cernan on to talk about how he approaches world building. It was fantastic. Go back exactly one episode and you'll hear it. (laughs) In case you flatly refuse to do so and you're not familiar with Matt Cernan, he's worked on whatever your favorite D&D world is in some fashion. (laughs) And has done so much incredible work in the industry. Yeah. In this one, Matt guides us through some of the different parts of a world that you might want to consider along your creative journey and how they'll all impact each other in your mind to create something truly original that inspires you. And he provided a short list of filters and topics that he uses and considers critical to doing some of your own world building, whether it's for the consumption of just the players at your table or public consumption. If you're going to make a million bucks selling that world. (laughs) And in this second meeting with Matt, we were hoping that he would just run wild on the podcast. So let's just turn it over to him. We're going to jump to our hangout with Matt. Yeah, so... I guess what I'd like to do, because I think it'd be fun, is cover the topics that I think are fundamental to world building and and things that people should think about, and then have those be kind of mad lib things that people can fill in and suggest that then maybe in some later discussion, we uh, cobble together into something unique. So because there are various elements that you have to sort of think about when you're building your own world for uh, consumption of others. When you're doing that as an individual, you're bringing your own biases and desires and feelings and so on. And, uh, and that's how you are getting to whatever it is that you're producing. When you do that as a group, you're navigating the relationships you have with all the other people who are creating this together with you. And they have their own ideas and inputs and you have to sort of mash all that stuff together, hopefully in a way that's cohesive and coherent and compelling uh, and other co words. Um. (laughs) Yeah. And I like, it's starting to make more and more sense to me how you're saying that it's all a work of whoever's working on it. Because if you give a list of, you know, eight prompts to a, group a different group of three people they're going to come up with a completely different world than we might cobble together out of that exact same list so i'm very excited about it too so we're just going to take a quick break there to hop to the griffin street market before we continue with this interview with matt cernan must have provisions and supplies can be found for the right price at the griffin street market i've got something this time that's going to spice up any party. Ooh. Guaranteed. That's a bold claim. Better back it up. All right. You want to crack off a lightning bolt to impress your friends? Or create 600 massive butterflies to win yourself a date? (laughs) I had never had that inclination, (laughs) but go on. Maybe you want to turn someone into a giant so they can sing karaoke with canyon-sized lungs. (laughs) You can do all of this and more. This all seems very (laughs) random. Once you get your hands on the Wand of Wonder. Again, this feels very dangerous if in the wrong hands. Well, sure. Just don't put it in those hands. That requires a surprising level of personal responsibility that I'm just not comfortable with. 
I'm sure that this thing has some downsides. Well, it can make a literal cloud of stink, I guess. I didn't mention that in the pitch. I think like a dangerous vehicle, you have some obligation to your buyer to disclose some of the dangers of the <laughs> thing that you are selling them. Fine. It's also completely random what effect comes out of it. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a huge liability. How about we huck something that is a little bit less dangerous? That's fair. Maybe we can sell this as a weather vane. <laughs> what we can sell, though, is something good. I promise. It's something that saved my ass in the last session that I was running, where I finally gave some gruesome detail to the bugbears that the party had been getting a little too comfortable with. Hmm. Had to introduce some scary bits again. Yeah, this is sounding a little bit more up our alley. Continue. Well, think of it this way. You know that moment when you're giving out a magic item and you want it to be a cool, mysterious, powerful moment, but you really don't know how to get that across? Well, what if you had just the right box text for that item instead of its stats? Yeah, Describe makes this incredibly easy. They have 1,700 and growing box text for you covering spells, monsters, places, NPCs, items, and are constantly creating new options. One of the cool things is that they're not super long-winded poetic monologues. They get the sensory experience, the narrative tone, and a prompt for action and roleplay really quickly. On average, under 70 words for each of these. And some of those are the fine, fine work of our guest today, Matt Cernit. But tell you what, let's try to actually put this into practice and show you how quick it is. Give me a random monster. Uh, a black dragon wormling. Okay, I got it. The draconic creature, serpentine in appearance and roughly the size of a large dog, slithers towards you. Its eyes are sharp and cunning, its scales black like obsidian, its nostrils flared as it breathes in your scent. Hooked wicked teeth flash as its maw gapes, saliva drips, caustic, green, and hissing. Woo! Run away from that. Hell yeah, you do. And you did not need to say, uh, this is a black dragon, they're known for the acid breath. They so have uh, 15 HP. I mean, uh, <laughs> shit. They're pretty... Uh, they're scary. They are scary. Well, there you go. That's Describe in a Nutshell. So you can go to describe.com forward slash hook. That's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com forward slash hook. And use the coupon code hook for 10% off. All right, back to our interview. All right, well, let's get into some of your steps. So first one, and I might be jumping the gun here, but did you want to run through maybe all of them and then we can break them down one at a time? Yeah, that sounds great. Just as a list, the things that I think people should really um, think about are cosmology, religion, your genre or subgenre, culture, politics, era, magic slash technologies, and theme. We can get into the definitions of all these things. They cross streams quite a bit. You know, there isn't, this isn't an order of operations to any degree. Oftentimes, I think people think about sort of genre and subgenre and era and all that kind of stuff kind of all at once because they, they are considering some sort of, you know, medieval fantasy. And so bang, that, that, that gets them in a particular place. If we want to just sort of define them briefly, I would say cosmology is in a sci-fi setting. It's literally planets and solar systems and stuff like that. In any sort of supernatural setting, it's the degree to which there are alternate worlds or realities that the setting includes. So, you know, are there ghosts? Is there a shadow realm? You know, is there a mirror universe? Like all of that type of stuff. And then religion is 
literally what religions do you include in your setting? Are they real world religions? Are they new religions that you're creating? What is all that about? You have to sort of think about that even if you're not really interested in it because the real world does have a lot of um, reflections of religion in it. And so you need to understand what that is. Uh, genre and subgenre, pretty you know, self-explanatory. That's everything from big stuff like sci-fi versus fantasy all the way down to 80s mystery set in Scandinavia, right? Like could be anything. Culture is uh, sort of a pretty broad topic, but that's what cultures you see reflected in the world. It's, it's basically impossible for us to invent cultures whole cloth. They're always going to be reflections of the things that we know and understand. If you want to represent new cultures, fantastical cultures, sci-fi cultures that don't exist in the world, you really should have sort of a broader understanding of cultures other than your own, try and sort of gain that. We can talk about having a lot of ingredients that you can use to mix in your kitchen. And that it, that's a matter of, of just learning a lot of stuff, but I'll, that's a side note. So politics is obviously, what are the politics in the setting that you're creating? Even if you're dealing with something small scale, a story that deals with like, you know, some kid in a small town, they live in a universe where there are larger um, political forces. And so those are things that you should think about as far as like, what are those forces and what the politics of that say about your setting? A lot of settings set in fantasy worlds um, rely upon the idea of like the divine right of kings, which is just sort of embedded in a lot of our fantasy, especially European fantasy ideas of you know, King Arthur and stuff like that. And so we're, we're kind of handed down all of this stuff about the divine right of kings. We kind of take it as normal for kings and princes and queens to be these powerful forces and generally good or stabilizing forces in the universe of a setting. So when you're creating something of your own, you need to consider like what your politics in the setting say about your world. And then era is obviously what timeline it's set in. Like, is it you know, that, that sort of dictates what general technologies there are available to your characters, but there's really a, an enormous range in what that means, because whenever you examine something through the lens of the real world, you understand how much the world changes over a short period of time, especially in recent history. So the difference between the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, you know, and then even individual years within those and the technologies that were available is really quite stunning uh, when you think about it. And so each of those little slices is its own era and time capsule that you need to think about when you're thinking about sort of setting something in that period. And then if you go farther back in history, you can be forgiven for thinking that things are more stable over time, that there's more decades of time where things look largely the same. You know, if you go back to the, the, the Bronze Age, it seems like there are hundreds of years where largely technology didn't change. People went to war and all this other stuff and so on and whatever, like that, that was the Bronze Age. It's a big period of time. Neanderthals lived in one cave for 65,000 years. <laughs> So, wow, like their lives really didn't change, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I mean, you know, they, they just generation after generation after generation living almost exactly the same lives. But if you really get close to that stuff and examine it, there are oftentimes enormous changes that happen, whether it's the, you know, developments in the technology for chariots or armor, or, you know, there's something called the Greek Dark Ages, where essentially like there was a societal collapse. And in the Bronze Ages, like every major city around the Mediterranean uh, was destroyed besides like three. And we don't know why, right? Like, so, so like, you know, if we could go back in a, in a time machine and look at that period, it would not be this long period of the sameness, right? There would be all of these ups and downs and tumult and changes and, and so on. So magic and technology, 
huge topic. I love talking about magic technology because they have such enormous impact on a setting. Everything from, you know, the force to d and system of magic to the way that in Star Trek you can beam down and beam up from things. There are always implicit and explicit lessons in your fiction about how magic works. And when people find plot holes in stories based upon technology and magic, it's usually because you violated some implicit or explicit lesson that you step. So just a short example, not to get into Star Wars controversy, because that's a whole <laughs> other thing. But there are explicit lessons in the original trilogy where Ben Kenobi says, this is how the force works. And that's in the script. Yoda says, this is how the force works. There are implicit lessons. When Ben Kenobi entrances the stormtroopers, he waves his hand in front of them and says, these are not the droids you're looking for. Or he, or it's, he even just sort of waves it, I think, in his lap or something. Anyways, um, when he's in the bar, he tries the same trick and it doesn't work. So we have an implicit lesson there. He's got to do some little thing and there's some nearness that has to happen and it doesn't always work, right? So like, he can't just go around tricking everybody like there's something there that, that where sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, when Darth Vader force chokes people, he has to make this little motion. It's, he pinches his finger <laughs> and, and then their, their, their throat chokes up and they die. He doesn't fly behind Luke's X-wing and force choke him from behind, right? There's, there's some thing where somebody has to see that happening or, or something's happening. There's an implicit lesson there. Later movies disregarded that implicit lesson. They don't have to look anymore. He's got, a, he's got his back turned and he turns around. Aha, I've been force choking you. And it's like, what, 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 huh? <laughs> you know, or somebody force chokes somebody from across the universe, right? And it's like, what's happening there? Right, it so, just breaks the rules, yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you, there are implicit and explicit lessons that you are creating with your magic and technology in your fiction. One other favorite example of mine is beaming down at Star Trek. How far can you beam someone through space in Star Trek? You got to be above the planet. You got to be within hovering range of uh, <laughs> right. whatever right. that is. Yes. Right. Like, but, but like, but, but why? Like what's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just like data being sent over, like, but, but like, why is there a range? And, but that range we know is at least because of every example we've seen implicitly from the setting is that orbital range, right? And now that's actually super far, like orbital range from, you know, that's, that's miles and miles. So like, you know, in space, that's a huge distance. But anyways, that, okay, orbital range. How many people can you beam down at once? As many as fit on that pad. <laughs> Cram in. Right? Yeah. And, well, well, like, can't we just make a bigger pad? Like, <laughs> like what, <laughs> what's stopping us? Like, why don't we beam armies down onto the surface of planets in giant spaceship size, aircraft carrier size beaming pads that beam armies down and, and beam down tanks and stuff like that? Oh, for that matter, why do we even bother beaming people at all? Why don't we have beam wars on a planet where people beam bombs back and forth at one another and blow things up? Oh, heck yeah. Well, the answer is it's implicit lessons about the technology, which is that you generally don't see people beaming around on a planet. Like they don't beam from one side of the planet to the other for some mm -hmm. reason. It, uh, does the planet interfere? Uh, I don't know. You got to be in space to do, to do your beam. Yeah. You need yeah. all that space around you to and, uh, <laughs> make it go. And the other thing is that implicit within the universe uh, that Gene Roddenberry created was this idealism that he built into the, the world of Star Trek that he created. And so if you decided as the next writer of uh, the next Star Trek movie or show or whatever to have the great beam wars where everyone was beaming bombs around on the planet and stuff like that, you would probably turn off a large part of your audience by creating that story, even though explicitly there's nothing that says that this wouldn't happen. And when you think about it, yeah, that, I mean, I'd beam bombs down. That seems effective, right? <laughs> like, Why are we lasering the planet when we could beam nuclear bombs down there, right? you want to sort of be aware of the implicit and explicit lessons of your setting that you're creating when you're creating your systems of magic and technology. So the last thing I think is theme. 
that's basically like, what is your story? What is your world telling people? What is, what is the message that you want to give? What, what kind of lessons are you teaching in the fictions that you're creating for your, your world? It doesn't have to be one big idea, you know, like racism is bad or something like that. Uh, you know, it can be a multitude of things, but you really need to be aware of the way in which you're constructing your fictional universe is a means of transmitting that message. So Gene Roddenberry's very sort of idealized universe where the Federation is going out and exploring the universe and contacting aliens and trying to sort of make peace with them and create sort of this broader peaceful coalition across the universe is telling a very different story and has a very different theme than Star Wars, where it is a group of a rebellion against uh, a fascist state. There's other elements that are being told there all over the place um, with fate and, you know, the various rogues in the universe and all this other stuff, but that's the big story there. And so you know, your universe doesn't have to have that big story. It's just when you're creating it, understand that some of these things that you are creating are starting to build out a theme and you want to know what themes you're playing with when you're telling stories in this universe, highlight or diminish those themes as you go along. Totally. totally. Back up at the top of the order and, and dive into each in a little bit more depth, maybe with the, the cosmology. Okay. Cosmology is is both what worlds there are and the different realities that interface and layer over the world that you're telling a story in. You know, are there ghosts? Is that it because they're dead people's spirits or is it because they're beings trapped in an alternate reality? Are they, you know, like there are all these choices that you're making when you're deciding whether or not your, your world has ghosts and what it means. You know, is there a heaven and hell in your universe if there are ghosts, all those types of things. But it's also the size of the world that you tell your story in. I would say that it's not coincidental that most fantasies take place in a world that's about as big as Britain. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, there's sort of this expansive uh, feeling to uh, some places large to the British Isles where you have different locations and um, different cultures and so on it doesn't worry about the wider world to a great degree. So whether you're talking about Westeros or uh, Lord of the Rings or Dragonlance or uh, any number of fantasy settings, a lot of them deal with essentially one island or place on a little, little corner of a continent. And then the rest of the world beyond that is kind of that great foreign beyond that we don't worry about because we're just dealing with our own sort of European ideas of medieval fantasy and, and we're li- happy living in that little universe. Understand that that's a choice that you're making and that when you make that choice, it's significant because what it does is other everything else you haven't included. Wow. So, yeah you've made a deliberate choice to focus on Western medieval fantasy, and you've chosen to exclude all the other influences on the world that you've created. And when people come to your setting from elsewhere in the world, assuming that elsewhere exists, because sometimes in worlds, it doesn't exist. There's just that place. They're represented as foreign and other and exotic and alien. And so that's one of those weird elements where you've, you've sort of created a theme without knowing it, where there is this exotic other. So even if your setting is small, set like the British Isles, but you've decided, you know what, I'm going to populate this with people of all colors and so on. But the culture just happens to look like, you know, knights and kings and wizards and all that stuff that everyone's familiar with. Okay, somebody from somewhere else, they're foreign and exotic. They're new, you know? And also when you create that small world that's sort of cut off from the rest of reality, that's not how history works. Great Britain was an island that has been invaded by the Romans (laughs) 
for, for centuries, right? The Romans were there. And so the Romans came from way the hell off in, you know, Italy. And, and then they went all the way across the continent of Europe and sailed across the ocean. They apparently brought an elephant or two, like, <laughs> <laughs> like right. invaded Great Britain. And then built a whole wall across the damn thing. And then another one, and like a few years later, like they changed so much about this little island. And yet in our fantasies of various worlds, they're still cut off. They don't have those impacts from other places. Uh, you know, later on in the history of Great Britain, it was, you know, the Vikings and the Normans and like all these different peoples. And there's, there's some evidence, although it's disputed of, even ancient Bronze Age contact with Britain from various um, places in the Mediterranean. So if you're creating a world where you want this small setting because you want to control that, that universe that you're, you're building in, just remember to think about that world outside and remember to think about how it might impact the world that you've created. And I mean, I would say in general, try not to other the rest of the world because the reality is they they aren't the other. They're people that are, would be traded with and so on and so forth. Or, you know what? Make that universe small. Keep it small. Ignore the rest of the world. And and just try and keep it its own little island where by itself um, where you're telling your stories. Because you don't need the rest of that other stuff. But understand that you're making that choice. So how do you so, a- actively um, not other those other places is it just a matter of of making sure to detail those other places out in at least close to how much you've detailed out the original place or like how do you actually do that i would say just be cognizant of the fact that there's going to be connections and and then understand what those connections will mean in the setting that are meaningful to the story that you're telling if you're creating a blade runner style universe where there's mega cities and uh you're telling a story in one particular mega city because that's the one you're focused on and interested in just consider the fact that like well there's probably others in this universe what are they like and then what impact does this have on the world that i'm creating so if there is if you're if you're in you know future tokyo or whatever is one of the corporations that's a big part of the setting from some other mega city someplace else. Is there some organization in your setting that is made up of refugees or expatriates or maybe even a mob or something like that that is from some other place? Or, or is, is there the equivalent of a little Italy you know, from this other location? Or are their cultures so similar that it doesn't matter, you know, and, and really you're telling a story about two cities. Just, you know, just consider what impacts they could have because that'll probably enliven the world that you're creating. Well, and to your point, Matt, it doesn't necessarily have to influence your story in a great deal, but just knowing and having some semblance of what that cosmology looks like you know, what what is conjured in my mind is Stephen King's cosmology. It barely touches on some of the wild, like the absolutely buck wild cosmology that he's got with, you know, space turtles and and all kinds of stuff like that. And it doesn't necessarily find its way into every one of his stories, but they are all linked. And even just in his own mind, it may not even make an appearance in that story, but just knowing how all of that stuff plays together really helps kind of flesh out and make that world feel real. One of the things that people who are, who are trying to build small and create that little universe are doing, which is really good, which is control the amount of stuff that they have to create, Mm -hmm. control the world that they're building so that that it doesn't sprawl out of their control and that that they don't have to keep track of things in in their own sort of like internal wiki that they have to build, you know, like, (laughs) I, uh, like, and that's, that's a super cool instinct, but, and I think really good instinct because it is when you're creating your own universe, easy to sort of sprawl out of control. Um, but understand that there will be opportunities that you create when you give some thought to the rest of the universe, the cosmology um, that you're creating. 
So when you think about that other continent, when you think about, okay, is there such a thing as heaven or hell in my world? That's a real thing. That's a thing that happens to souls or people. You know, if you think about, is there a shadow realm that people can access somehow, you will find opportunities in the future, perhaps, to use that in a story or build off of that. So taking the Blade Runner example, you've got your, your, your future Tokyo or something like that, and you've embedded into it the idea of new San Francisco, which is a rebuilt city because San Francisco died in an earthquake and it's been built out on an island somewhere. I don't know, blah, 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 making up stuff. <laughs> well, if you've built up this story world and people are really interested in it, and whether you're it's through a novel or graphic novels, or maybe you've created a game product or something like that, then that new San Francisco becomes someplace that you can visit with a character or a story or an expansion that gives you more places to explore in this world that you've created. And so, you know, you're giving yourself future opportunities by thinking about that larger cosmology that you're creating. It's interesting because you're talking about the difference between that really expanding upon them and keeping it uh, small and simple. It's funny how most stories end up doing that even Star Trek came to mind when you were talking because Star Trek is supposed to be an expansive universe but really the cosmology in the terms that we're talking about is the ship and everything else the ship is the world that we're exploring and it comes into contact with other stuff yes yes precisely and then as Star Trek went on it built upon ideas so the Klingons show up and they're just a one-off in some episode but Star Trek Next Generation takes that ball and just runs with it right and then Star Trek Deep Space Nine builds on it even more. And then the movies build on it, you know. And so, so now, you know, you can go to a sci-fi convention pretty much anywhere in the world and find people dressed as Klingons talking in the Klingon language because that's like <laughs> a thing that happened. And that wouldn't have happened without that first initial sort of exploration of what Klingons are in, you know, the original series. And then, you know, it got built upon as it went along. And taking some time to think about this is also really important because I've seen documentaries with some of the original production designers for Star Trek saying, God, I wish we'd put more thought into this, knowing that we were crafting and creating a world that would live on far beyond this ridiculous TV show that that we thought we were making. (laughs) You know, where we placed this button was now going to influence everything that comes after it. Yep. Not to not to stress any creators out. <laughs> <laughs> genre and subgenre. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, like I said, th- that's such a wide variety of of things. I would just say that whatever wherever you land in genre and subgenre, you should really examine the principles behind it. Think about why it exists. Try and investigate its history a little bit. All of those things are going to to sort of give you tools in your arsenal to craft something unique and special of your own. One of the things that in my thinking about a genre, I always try and keep in mind is that pretty much every great Western story is based on a revenge plot. You know, there are Western stories that aren't revenge based, but it's always extra legal stories, right? Like, you know, there, there's the idea of the West and, and gunfighters and all that kind of stuff is based upon the idea that essentially the law, the lawful authorities, normal society doesn't control everything. There are people running around with guns and bows and arrows and stuff like that. And you can't stop them sometimes, except by taking justice into your own hands and, and, and doing something yourself. And that's, that's at the heart of pretty much every great Western story is that that moment when the hero has to take matters into their own hands and go and do X, Y, and Z or defend against the bad guys coming in or get whatnot. Totally. And you're making me think about how you're saying these categories kind of bleed together because from what I'm hearing, you're saying that sometimes a genre or a subgenre is going to have a theme baked right into it or different elements baked right into it almost. Right. And so you can tell a story set in the West that isn't a revenge story and and it just has the Western trappings, right? So like Little House on the Prairie, I, I don't recall any revenge stories. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a very different television show. <laughs> um, 
even though it's it has all the trappings of of sort of a western it doesn't feel like a western right like it doesn't feel like what we associate with that kind of story and so in the same way you can tell a story that is set in sort of that film noir era and has the trappings of the film noir era the story can be black and white but if it doesn't involve some of those central themes, the politics and all that kind of stuff that's going on in that sort of story, then you and the archetypes, then, then you're it's not going to feel like an actual film noir, even though it's got all the trappings for it. Which so, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Just like you keep saying, be aware of what you're doing. Right. And if you're going to be building something in that genre, it's good to inform yourself about the birth of that genre, where it comes from, the kind of tropes that it relies upon. And then that helps you both in understanding what you're building on so that you can build something new or rely on those tropes and lean into them. It also helps you avoid pitfalls. So the Lovecraft was uh, an incredibly creative guy, but man, that guy was a racist. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like, like you, you cannot, you cannot read his fiction and not realize that he was a racist. And and then it, if you get into his personal letters, he's even worse. Like he's a complete xenophobe, and he's totally sexist to boot. Like the guy was kind of bad news. And so if you're going to create something in the Lovecraft universe understand that you're you're leaning upon the creation the creativity of someone with all of those trappings and so people who are sort of tangentially familiar with Lovecraft and Cthulhu are like yay Lovecraft Cthulhu I don't care people who are more informed are going to say hey why are you using this racist work when you could do something of your own or you know or the, they're going to, if there is any sort of hint of racism within your own work because you're relying upon the work that he's already built, then you're kind of accidentally bearing his flag forward. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's why you see in some of the recent things that have been done with Lovecraft, the, there are creators who are looking at that through the lens of racism, right? So you Lovecraft um, County, the TV show. Yeah. Like it's all over that. Um, but then uh, there was a Cthulhu game called um, Sinking City and it doesn't shy away from that either. Right. Like this, the racism is something that it confronts and then it, it deals with in, in the story in various ways. There's actually a point at which your character can go and decide to just like shoot up a, a KKK meeting, you know, just understand some of the nature of the, the genre that you're dealing with the forces that helped create it, the things that helped invent it, and you'll be on better footing to create your own thing or to rely on the tropes that you're, you're using. So, mm -hmm. and that might be wizards and fantasy. Like, why do they use spell books? What does it mean to cast spells out of a spell book? It, like, is, does your wizard have a wand? Do they have a pointy hat? Do they live in a tower? What are the tropes that you're using? And then what do they mean in the universe that you're creating? Yeah, like you're saying, if you take the time to understand all of the ways that wizards have been portrayed, then you can either borrow from one of those or intentionally add a spin to it that makes it yours. Yeah, right. And so, you know, and, and it, it might be, you know, a genre mash, right? A lot of times you get a lot of creativity and fun from mixing and matching genres. And so, you know, you don't have to think of just purely in terms of Western or blah, 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 right? Like maybe it's your fantasy Western and then you're like, okay, well, that's not just because it's set in the Wild West. It, it's a fantasy, so that's not it. Like, what is it? Well, what's what's fantasy about it? Well, spell casting. Okay, well, maybe they're wizards. Wizards are like gunslingers. All right, wizards through the lens of gunslinger. Okay, <laughs> where is that taking us? What's the revenge story there? What's the what does it mean to have What's, what's the equivalent of a six shooter for, for a wizard, right? And then like you have to think about all that stuff that you're creating and then you can get some really interesting places. Now, on the face of it, wizards as gunslingers just sounds super cool. So, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like just, just sort of like painting the wizard with gunslinger motifs, right? Like being that kind of cool look to them where the wizard has a leather vest and, you know, the, the, the hip belt and, you know, all that kind of thing. Like, like suddenly you're like, Oh, that's super cool. There's something there. 
So then explore that further and understand what you're creating so that it's more than just the trappings that you've created something perhaps entirely new to what people have seen before. Right. It becomes a lot more interesting when you do more than just skim off the top. Yeah. Now that said, I, you, know, you can get a lot of ground covered by skimming off the top. Of it. <laughs> if you gave the, if you gave an artist the prompt of like wizard gunslinger and like just set them loose, you'd probably get some really <laughs> freaking cool art. So, and, and intentionally having people draw those conclusions can help get your idea across so quickly because when you do say wizard gunslinger, we're all on board. I'm thinking of another RPG that our our cousin is launching a a new podcast that takes place with this new rpg that just came out called slug blaster and it's 90s kids uh dimension hopping like we kind of already get the vibes that that's going for because it has borrowed from from those kind of tropes and we can just go yeah cool i'm on board i'm done yep so that's genre and subgenre there's lots to dive into there, the, the main takeaway is just like, try and do a, a bit of study about the genres that you're playing with so that you're informed enough to build off of and reflect things that you want and to avoid things that you want to avoid. Very similar message about religion. So religion is something that exists in the world, even if you're like, a radical atheist and you, you want to tell a radical atheist story where like this, you got a world where there's just no gods and they're never mentioned more power to you, but you're relying upon thousands of years of language and culture in which all of this stuff is embedded. And so even if you don't realize that you're doing it, there's often ways in which, you know, religions of the world past and present impact culture. And so just think about those. So if you're creating an entirely new world, fantasy or sci-fi or whatever, there's basic stuff like, do you have a Monday through Sunday days of the week? Does it matter to you to change those? Because let me tell you, it is a pain in the ass to <laughs> to change that, <laughs> right? Like there's so many basic assumptions that people have about like the 24 hour day, days of the week, the names of the planets, all the different things that, that are just embedded in our culture that feel like just normal things that when you fight against them, you're, you're always asking the audience to take an extra step. You know, if, if you have decided that, you know, on a different planet, the, the days of the years are longer because the you, revolves more slowly around the sun or whatever, like, oh, God, like <laughs> day 453 of the month of Julian, like what? Oh, God. <laughs> Pathfinder did that, didn't they? They had a 10 day week. And yeah. I remember playing that and it took so much mental energy on something that really unless it was going to be a core part of the story or it was going to reflect something bigger. It was just like, why am I wasting all this? Uh, we're going to retcon that. That's uh, it's now a seven day week because <laughs> holy crap, right. who's got the time? <laughs> yeah. So, so in the Forgotten Realms, just to get back to cosmology and stuff like that, the Forgotten Realms has a 10 day week and then a series of holidays throughout the year that take up the extra days. So mm. there are 10 day weeks, four week months, 10, and um, all that adds up to 360. And then there are five holidays that are between the months um, yeah. in the year. And when you think about it, it's like Jiminy Cricket. That makes so much sense, right? It, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to remember that, that, that February ends on the 28th and there's a leap year and like, oh, well, actually they do account for a leap year in the front rounds, but whatever. <laughs> um, and then also, wouldn't it be awesome if we all agreed upon like a single holiday between the months, right? Like that just sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, you just, you just described utopia, Matt. I think you fixed it. But like, that's, that's, it's also like super hard to do that. Like it's, it's just, it becomes this real struggle uh, that happens, you know, in everyday stuff. And then, you know, um, when you've made that decision, then suddenly you can't use Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's now third day of, or second week and, you know, stuff like that. And it's third day of second week. Okay. Is that a two, Wednesday? Uh, uh, and, and then, you know, if you've made that decision, okay, well, wait, do they have clocks? Is it one o'clock? Well, now it's so many, do they have hours? And then 
suddenly everything starts to unravel and you start sort of creating all of these little bits and bobs to your universe that become barriers to entry for a lot of folks. Because when you say it's seven bells and 12 heartbeats until we have to go and do something, nobody knows what that means. Like, is that, is that hours or is it minutes? Like, I don't, I don't understand. And, and so when you're creating sort of that, that cosmology, understand that you're, and, and like discarding things that we have in the real world, it becomes difficult. Now, I would point out that it is often perfectly okay to just steal stuff from the real world and put it in your setting and disregard the fact that it doesn't make much sense. So, <laughs> and yeah, as, it makes it easier for people. Yeah. You know what? Like, like Christmas is a big part of the Narnia stories and arguably Christianity is a big part of those stories as well in sort of this weirdly unspoken way in some parts of the story and stuff like that. But a big reason why Christmas is a big part of those stories is because the author just wanted Christmas. And (laughs) (laughs) Christmas occurs in the Wind in the Willows, uh, which is a story about animals and has nothing to do with Christianity whatsoever. But the basic assumption was that the readers who would be reading it would be familiar with what Christmas is. And the author wanted to celebrate Christmas with his characters. And it was something that, that felt like seasonal. It was seasonally appropriate. It felt like that right sort of beat in the story. And so that's something that the author did. You know, the author was also writing for his son and the son probably was celebrating Christmas around the same time the letter was written, but whatever. So, you know, you can borrow stuff like that. Just do a little research, digging in a little bit and, and figure things out and find out what works and what doesn't for you. And then have that color your world. Because again, it's about building on a strong foundation and then creating something perhaps wholly new and then also giving yourself the opportunity to do new things and explorations in the future. And I think you've added to the idea. So now I'm imagining a gunslinger wizard that's getting revenge on Santa. <laughs> I'd be into that. <laughs> so culture, big thing. It's just a huge topic. I would just, again, it's one of those things where the more informed you are, the more ingredients you have in your kitchen and the better you'll be able to build something unique and new without making mistakes, relying on tropes that you, you don't mean to that kind of a thing. Even when you're relying on your own culture and your own memories of your life, it pays to do a little bit of research to understand what were the forces in play that created the world that you lived in. So if I were to go back and write a story about the eighties, set in the 80s, I wouldn't just rely on my memories of what the 80s were like. I I would go back and do the research on what technology was available when, when certain fashions came in and out of play, what were the politics going on at the time, that kind of a thing. Culture is really about, again, getting enough sort of like grist for your mill, understanding what's going on. And the more sort of like you know about a period or a place or in a culture, the more authentic you can make it feel in your world building and the stories that you tell. And that's a great point about like how narrow our understanding of our own culture is. Cause I mean, that's kind of what our culture is going through right now is we're needing to update how well we know our own culture, the other parts of our own culture that we don't experience firsthand. So yeah, like your own perspective is so narrow sometimes. Even when you're talking about things that seem really simple in your head, it pays to just do a little investigation. So if you think like, okay, I'm going to make up this alien race in my world and they're a bit like Klingons. First, you might want to avoid that because that's been done a thousand times. (laughs) Second, maybe not because you know what? It's been done successfully like a thousand times. But examine what it is that made Klingons feel like Klingons and how they evolved over time. What tropes in that are you actually relying upon? Which which are you avoiding to sort of create your own thing that's separate from that? Is it that warrior culture? Is it the sort of hyper-masculinity, toxic masculinity that's all over that culture? Is it the strange sort of samurai trappings that come along with it? You know, what what is it that you're relying on? Maybe it's just the head bumps. Um, (laughs) What are you taking away from that? And, and then how are you making it unique for yourself? If you, if you are thinking like these people in my setting, they're like the Nazis of my setting, just know that that's a super huge red flag 
the KKK of my setting, like, wow, careful. Like okay. the, those are stories that sometimes people need to tell and want to tell. And I encourage people who, who want to tell that kind of story to really do the research so that they don't unintentionally glorify those elements um, that really shouldn't be. Now, if they are intentionally glorifying it, I encourage them to round file their ideas and <laughs> <laughs> go to hell. Um, <laughs> but just understand that when you are making a story about sort of an oppressive group like that, there are echoes in the real world and you need to just be aware of how meaningful and real the impact of those real world organizations and things are even today. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to say you can't have villains in your setting. You can have big organizations of bad guys and all that kind of stuff. Just know that like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get close to that, hitting it on the target, right. People will recognize it. They will see it. You need to be ready for their reaction to that. Um, so then we get into politics and that's very similar when you have the politics of a setting where it's kind of fantasy land where there's Kings and princes and Queens and stuff like that. A lot of fantasy kind of ignores the reality of what it is to live in a world like that for people, which for most people, I mean, it was not great. Uh, <laughs> you know, like the, the sort of fantasy trapping version of that world is very, I'm going to use the word anodyne. It's very sterile. It's the kings and queens and rulers are, are so benign. Their, their rule is benign. And when you think about it, the way that kings and queens and rulers and nobles and stuff like that are portrayed in fantasy generally is not too far off from how people in, say, the 50s and 60s portrayed the police and mayors in TV shows, right? Like, they are... They're just these universally nice folks. And even when they're bad, they're the bad ones. Uh, not, right. They're not part of an entire system that is corrupt and corruptible. And any sort of real view of the politics of your world, any realistic sort of take on the politics of your world is going to see a system of power that is corrupt and corruptible because every version of politics in the world that we've created. <laughs> is I mean, I can think of a few off my hand that are, that are pretty decent right now, but the vast majority of them are oppressive in some manner. And so like, just, just understand that. And then if you're going to present bright and shiny, happy face on one of these systems, understand that you're doing so yeah there definitely is a common ground between the points that you're making about these which is just deepen your understanding of what you're drawing inspiration from and use it intentionally yeah absolutely um which brings us to to era um and that's the the, the same thing I, I already kind of touched upon this era is more than just fashion choices and whether or not somebody has a cell phone it's it it's a lot more than that. And it doesn't have to be more than that. Uh, you can tell your horror movie story and set it in the 80s so that nobody has a cell phone. Or you can set it in the present day and have something disastrous happen to everybody's cell phone. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't Everybody matter because it, ultimately it's about a haunted house mystery or, or horror show or there's a serial killer or something. And everything else is just sort of trappings around the story that you're telling. It really doesn't, it's just there, then not there. Or the world that you're creating might be something bigger and the elements that come into play in your story and your world might have a greater impact because of the themes that are present, because of the politics of the era, because of the types of technologies that arise in the era, that kind of thing. Just again, it's like being cognizant of what era means and how you're using it and whether or not it's helping you or hurting you in the way that you're trying to tell the story that you're trying to tell. The example that jumps to my mind is with every one of the Assassin's Creed stories. Essentially, it's a similar kind of story, but depending on the era that you threw it in and potentially the politics that was taking place during that era, 
you've got a radically different story and different even game mechanics that were built around the technologies and the era that that was set in. You've completely changed things with just a very subtle shift of, oh, we're going to go forward 150 years and we're going to go to France. Now all of a sudden it's totally different. And if you're playing sort of the Mad Libs game of combining ideas, one of the really fun things to do is as a just thought experiment is to shift the era of a story that you love and find out if that works or it, it, it doesn't, right? Like Indiana Jones, you know, he's fighting the Nazis a lot. Go forward in time. Does the story work, right? Like, does the character work? Does the way that he does archaeology, quote unquote, work? You know, we've seen experiments in telling stories that move the timeline farther forward and you be the judge whether or not that worked for good or ill um uh james bond is another one where you know the character has has existed in various eras from from basically the 60s onward to the present day and often using technologies that aren't available at the time Some of the very early James Bond stories don't actually have anything particularly techno whiz banging besides, you know, secret compartments and stuff like that. So can you advance a James Bond story really far into the future, right? Is it still going to be fun to tell James Bond story in 2050? You know, I don't know. Probably. Uh, Can you pull it farther back? Can you do James Bond in 1780? Yeah, I think you can. Right. And like, like that would be pretty freaking cool. Right. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's a different story, but you can totally do it. And so you can kind of just play with that range of things when you're sort of mad living things together and trying to think about your ideas. Like maybe you've, you've got an idea for, for your medieval fantasy world. And then you're like, okay, well, how medieval? Well, I want guns. Okay, well, that's not medieval then. You've, if you made this decision you want guns, then you've, you've drifted farther forward in time. That changes what fortifications look like that changes how people wear armor that changes the kinds of other things that have come along in their culture in real world history uh, as far as their imports and exports and all that kind of stuff and so you have to make decisions how much of that you want to incorporate into your thinking about your setting like if fortifications have changed their appearance a lot well then maybe you've departed too far from what is medieval fantasy because there's all kinds of ways in which fortifications were changed to deal with the advancements of cannon fire and guns versus crossbows versus bows versus all that kind of stuff. I found kind of challenging when first starting to world build from my starting point, which was Dungeons and Dragons. And when you start trying to make your own world, but you want to keep all of the flavors and mechanics and all of these elements that exist in D&D, it's pretty hard to incorporate all of that into like you said something as simple as the fortifications i mean even magic that exists in D is going to drastically affect those fortifications right i mean and D D largely just avoids the issue the vast majority of of settings built for dungeons and dragons have really not considered the idea that if wizards and sorcerers and clerics and all these other druids and all these other spellcasters are common in the world, what that would mean for how wars are fought, how buildings are built, you know, all that kind of stuff. And when you try and start thinking about how all of those things would be impacted, it just becomes this mind blowing exercise (laughs) of like, I, you know, like, I don't know what to do about stone shape. Like, do they, is every fortification like then have to have a wizard who comes out every few days and casts this seventh level spell to protect it from, Oh, (laughs) you know, like. (laughs) You got a big staff. Like, like do, do people not fortify because it's just not worth it? And then like, what does that mean? And then, you know, like then there are all these giant monsters in the world. So do people fight giant monsters differently than they fight normal monsters? The answer would be if you had to do this thing for real and really examine these questions. Yes. So like there's a great set of videos. I think it might have been by a YouTuber called Scala Gladiatoria, I think is the the guy's channel name. And he does a ton of videos about sort of realistic uses for various weapons from various eras. And he delves a little bit into fantasy stuff. And one of the things that he delved into was 
what would you do with a giant? Like how would a giant be armed and armored? Because like, it turns out if you gave them a metal shield, even if they're really strong, that thing would be so freaking heavy, they couldn't lift it. So what, what would be an effective use of arms and armor for a giant? What would they actually wield? You know, would they have a sword? Would they have a club? You know, what would it be? And in his thinking anyway, when he was thinking about it, it was a giant wicker shield. Like imagine a tower shield made of, of wicker to stop arrows because that's what you're really worried about as a giant. You're really worried about a lot of arrows hitting you um, because that's what everybody would shoot at you. They wouldn't ca- try and come anywhere close to you. Right? <laughs> like yeah. nobody, nobody would run up against, a, against something, you know, 12 feet tall with a, a sword. They have a giant wicker shield. And then because people don't want to get close to you and they're probably using spears when they attack you, you've got like a long club uh, kind of thing, or perhaps a spear of your own that you can sweep the ground with and really just knock the feet out from everything and then stomp on them because you weigh, you know, 700 pounds or something like that. (laughs) There's all kinds of things like that. When you start thinking about a lot of those problems and those issues and the realities of things, they can take you to interesting places, but they can also take you to really boring places. You can create things, ideas that are really fascinating to people that are because they're new But you can also end up in kind of dead ends where, yeah, I understand that maybe that's how a giant would want to be armed and armored. But I want to see a giant wearing plate mail with a giant shield that he uses like a bulldozer and charges through people. And then he's got a huge flaming sword because that's cool. When you're trying to sort of figure out all that kind of stuff, be cognizant of when it's useful, when it's not. And also just like make choices that help you. So if magic is a real problem for you and you're trying to figure out how the world works with all these people who can cast spells and so on make magic rarer right (laughs) who can cast magic well very few people why well figure that out is it a birthright thing where they they have the blood or they don't is it midichlorians right (laughs) like is it contact with some ancient artifact that imbues them with power Do they have to drink the blood of strange animals in order to gain the the magic capacity? Is there a special rite that they have to do that requires some enormous sacrifice, right? Like maybe it's just you get rid of some of the classes that you don't like because they're too problematic. And you're like, well, it's just wizards. And so spell books and spell books and spells are super rare. They're hard to understand. Like you start sort of whittling down all these different things. If you want to include everything that D&D has, it is yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to make some some sacrifices for your yeah. world building. Yeah. Well, an yeah, example just, of... don't 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 worry about it too much. You're you're good. Like, <laughs> people, people will be fine if you don't think about all this stuff. They're, they're gonna have fun in your game. Like yeah. they, they'll just be happy they have a gun. Like it, it won't yeah. matter. Like you don't need to worry about the technology. Like an example of what you're talking about in in practice is actually my own campaign which started as a thought experiment of of how would you imprison people that can cast magic? And it ended up going through every single one of the spells in the player's handbook to figure out how would you counter that and restrict it if you were trying to imprison someone. And then it went into, you know, you've got magic item components or magic spell components that are difficult to get when you imprison someone. And then how would you... And so it, it just kept elaborating, but halfway through this campaign uh it very quickly dawned on me this is boring we, we're, <laughs> we're in a place that this kind of sucks let's get everyone out of here let's get this campaign going so yeah it, it's interesting to hear you kind of talk about some of these different elements it sounds like this is maybe the underlying theme to this entire episode doing it with intention and knowing that you're doing it for a particular reason and using it wisely on to the topic of magic technology, if we hadn't gotten there already. Um, If you're creating your own magic and technology for your world and setting or whatever, you have complete control. You can make the decisions that that have that, that impact. You can decide how difficult magic is to cast, whether there's a cost involved, how frequently people can do it. You know, like you can, you can make all those decisions. Just know that what they're, impact is on the story that you're telling and therefore how it impacts the world that you're creating with the caveat that sometimes it doesn't matter. So all of this world building, I recommend thinking about and doing all of this sort of deep thinking in order to create this really fleshed out, unique 
fantastic universe that you can tell stories in for a thousand years. But a good story will trump a well-built world every time. If you look at the Harry Potter universe and how magic works there and what magic can do, the answer is whatever the story needs, mm -hmm. right? If it, if it needs to have a, a moving image on a newspaper, it does that. Why? I don't know. It just seemed cool at the time, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's what they did. But like, what impact does that, that have on the rest of the world? Virtually nothing. It, there's a reporter character who shows up and that kind of pops up in the story. But like, where else does this magic technology get used? Well, I guess living paint. No, those are something entirely different. Like the pictures that people have on their mantle, I guess, sort of maybe do that. Like, well, why, why is it work that way? Why, why is it like a repeating GIF on, on a newspaper, <laughs> you know, that's a few seconds long or in a picture? Why isn't it longer? Like what, what are the things that go, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the story isn't focused on that. It doesn't care. And the story for uh, the vast majority of people who've read it is just so good that all of those concerns about little things like that definitely don't matter. And big things like this is a universe in which there are people without magic, people with magic. And that just seems really weird, right? The, the way that muggles are treated and thought about, like there's this echoes of racism and uh, it's, it's thorny issues. The books and stories just kind of bounce off of and touch, but don't really ever deal with. Like, okay, I guess, but <laughs> it works and it's had what's her name is like a cojillionaire because you know what she wasn't telling stories about all that stuff she was telling another story that was more compelling about characters that people care about and ultimately whenever you're doing your world building if you want your world to be successful commercially you need to have those characters and that story that people care about i would just say that if you do build a really intricately developed world where you've thought about a lot of that stuff your characters can be vehicles that express that world and they will can be living, breathing things that feel more real than in a lot of stories that you might read. And they don't make mistakes and, and there aren't logical gaps in your story because, you know, why doesn't Hermione just use that time thing all the time? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it, you're, you want to get to that space where you're telling that story. So think about all that other stuff, which brings us, I guess, to the last point, which is theme. And that is, what is the story you're telling? What are the messages you want that story to give? What are the things that you want to say in your story? Like, why do you want to tell a story? Is it just that you want to experience and express this world? Or are there things that you want to say about love, about family, about race, about uh, war, about people's relationships with their pets, whatever it might be? Is there something that you feel like you are trying to say with your story and what is it? Because if you, if you can identify that before you start telling your story, if you really understand what that is before you start telling your story, you'll really have a really strong foundation on which to build out the universe and the story that you're telling. There's plenty of stories that I feel like don't necessarily have a theme. We discussed that briefly a while back. Like, I, I don't know what the theme of Ghostbusters is. Like, I, I, <laughs> I've tried to figure it out. And, and they work. And they function perfectly fine without it. There are plenty of stories that really don't think about theme that deeply and what they're trying to express and they work fine. And so you don't have to do this work if it doesn't come naturally to you. Like if there isn't something where you're like, you know what, this experience in my childhood really impacted me and I want to talk about it in this oblique way, or I am really interested in ideas about what memory is and how it works, you know, and I want to express that somehow. You know, if those things aren't coming out of your, you know, you don't have to do this work, but just it's one of those things like keep, keep it in your mind. Like think about how the rest of your world is developing, what's coming out of it, what's bubbling out of it, and therefore what kind of theme comes out of the thing that you're crafting. You know, drawing upon ideas around how to build your world in a very similar fashion, you can do this with theme because I've gone into stories intentionally trying to tell a particular theme you know, and that's the I'm going to craft this world top down approach of I'm going to curate this experience. 
And then the bottom up is building, you know, like we talked about in the last time, uh, building locally and letting the players create that. Each of those players is going to bring somewhat of a theme with every one of their characters and being able to tie all of those together into a, hey, I've kind of noticed this interesting thread. I'm going to play with this theme so that all of these characters can interact with it. Theme is is an incredibly important thing to either do intentionally or or let it be a, a thing of its own. Yeah, I was just thinking kind of along the same lines because when I have had my theme first, like you're saying, Matt, it has helped me craft the other elements because now I can think like, okay, how does this other culture interact with this theme? That starts my brain churning at least. Whereas sometimes when I'm world building and I'm just trying to create stuff out of nothing, it's very difficult. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Yeah, and, and I think with all of these topics that we've discussed today, you don't have to have all of these pieces before you begin. Uh, you don't have to start in one particular place and, and, and end up getting them all by a certain time or anything like that. It's just have all this stuff kind of floating around in your head, uh, uh, allow it to uh, percolate. You know, if it's frustrating you to try and think about all that stuff, you know, just don't, <laughs> right? right? Very simple. Like, it's in your head. You, you've given enough thought to at least listen to this podcast and, and hear it, uh, hear it, uh, hear me out. So while you're you're off to the races and creating your own world with talking animals and they're I don't know they're they're doing uh, something with magic in um, Japan and you're off to the races and you're creating that stuff. You're going to draw upon your own experiences and your own knowledge and conversations like this. And it'll have a little impact and that'll help you navigate some of the problems that you uh, encounter as you're creating things. I mean, this list is incredibly impactful. And again, just the approach that Jordan and I like to take with a lot of the content that we try to create is that I can be creative within confines and being able to look at a list and then go, where am I going to add intention? Where am I just going to just move on and, and, say, yeah, this is my story. I don't need to come up with a reason. But all of these things allow you to be creative within those confines. And it's so powerful to help you craft your story and tell a, tell a compelling one. And that gets us to what I'm really excited about, which is the next step of this process, getting ideas from people and starting to see where it leads. Matt, thank you so much again for joining us. This has been just a tremendous conversation to kind of reflect on with all of my own world building that I've done. And I know that it'll, it'll probably serve us very, very well the next time we take to the, you know, you have that shower idea and you go, oh man, I got to do this. <laughs> uh, and doing it again with that intention is, is pretty powerful. Yeah. I, I, I hope that people, you know, get inspired and, and not too intimidated. I mean, I think a certain amount of intimidation in setting out on building a world is important because you're taking on a huge, huge project when you build your own setting from scratch. Some amount of sort of trepidation in that effort is warranted, but get over that hump, make something fantastic that we all are like, wow, yeah, hell yeah. Sign me up. Thank you for putting that into the world. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, again, it was such a pleasure. Cannot wait for the next the next time we get together. Yeah, thanks for continuing to join us. Take care, right. Matt. Thanks so much. Talk to you later. So over on our Discord, we are prompting the community there to help us generate some prompts for our next meeting with Matt. Some prompts to put all of this information and teachings he has provided into a little bit of real world practice. You still have time to participate. If you're listening to this within the first week of its release, hop on over to the Discord and help generate some of these ideas for Matt Cernit. And remember, this is THE Mr. Cernit, lore master for Wizards of the Coast, editor-in-chief of Dragon Magazine, and designer for Waterdeep Dragon Heist, Dungeon of the Man Beige, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, and Xanathar's Guide to Everything. He has worked on so much, and this is your opportunity to throw some ideas towards them so that we can collectively generate something really cool and unique in our next episode. And they're starting to roll in and it's going to be so fun to 
mesh and mold these, play with them. I cannot wait for our next meeting with Matt. So here's a couple of really nice comments from our YouTube. I just gotta say, keep these comments coming. They're so enjoyable and they warm our heart and they keep us going. Here's one. I think I stumbled upon a hidden treasure from our man Alexis and criminally underrated channel. Your videos have been so helpful to me as I'm just at the outset of two different campaigns with completely different groups and characters from Christian Lion. And Crow Play says, I just don't understand how this channel doesn't have more traffic. These guys hit a lot of topics that I'm wondering about as I'd love to DM, but just don't know how to deal with certain scenarios and they keep an hour long video interesting and it keeps me watching. Please keep up the great work. Holy smokes. Thanks, Crow. Well, if you keep walking past Crow, we'll have at least one traffic, <laughs> one unit of traffic. One traffic unit. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for those. Maybe the YouTube overlords will grace us with a little bit better on the algorithms. <laughs> if you keep showing up and leaving wonderful comments like that, we really do appreciate it. And while we're doling out all the appreciation, thanks to all of our wonderful patrons who help this channel grow, who are helping support it so that we can perhaps one day hire out the extensive editing work that we do. I am going buggy eyed right now <laughs> from editing this episode and they're really helping us to make more content if we can get this burden, this gigantic atlas sized weight off of our shoulders <laughs> so that we can create some other cool content it would certainly help if i wasn't just pestering travis the whole time while i was editing <laughs> so kind of working against ourselves but yes thank you so much for your support sith by 11 lucas lila the gm tim duke brian thomas w dm natsky heavy arms red fern john leprechaun and will hp you are all true heroes in our hearts. Thank you so much. And special thanks to Tabletop Audio for all the sound effects that you heard in this episode. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, Discord. Many of the medias. At Hook and Chance. At Hook and Chance. Join the uh, group of wonderful people on the Discord, as we've already mentioned. Thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening. And, and clouds of stink games. are always useful. No, they're not. They're never useful. <laughs>